Good afternoon, everyone. I am Wang Sheng from Rexon College. I'm doing first year at Building Archaeology with Professor Jessica Rawson. And today I'm going to talk about something everyone here must have ever heard of, that is the Silk Road. So hopefully there will be something new present to you in the following 20 or so minutes, and you are more than welcome to criticize and argue with me, um, because it is such a broad area that we should all explore together. Thank you very much. So, when it comes to the Silk Road, this probably might be your first impression. Um, however, today my main argument will be that the Silk Road was neither a road nor was the primary export silk. Um, first of all, let us see some traditional definition of the term Silk Road. It is actually defined in 18, 1877 by a German geographer called Ferdinand von Fischhofen. And this geographer, in his five volume book on China, firstly defined that the word Silk Road means um, a east, an east west route from the Han dynasty um, China to the Western Roman Empire, um, along which the silk was traded. And this kind of um, the Silk Road is, um, and the starting point of the Silk Road, um, as historically defined, uh, was the year of 114 BC, which was the year of Zhang Tian's um, embassy to the West, initiated by the Han Emperor of Wu, which is Han of Di. Um, and this kind of definition has long been used in the whole 20th century almost, but with more and more archaeological finds all over the world. Um, all over the world, scholars um, started to realize that the Silk Road was much more about silk itself. And within this 15 years or so, um, different archaeologists, art historians, and historians start to use different terms to describe the word silk, silk Road because they think that it might be a very complex network of different directions of routes. Um, transporting different kinds of things, not only the silk, um, almost all around the world. And there were not only um, the east-west route, as if the, China, it, as if the Silk Road is like something China-centered, um, rather um, it is a, a multi-direction idea. So referring to all the varied perspectives um, and researchers done since the 21st century, I simply put the definition of the Silk Road as follow, which is um, the Silk Road was a network of routes in the Asian world um, that connected China with the West Asia, Western Asia, the Eurasian steppe, um, the Mediterranean, and the Indian subcontinent, along which travels the traders, industries, monks, and pilgrims. And they all bring different kinds of luxury goods, technologies, new ideas, and even religions. Um, and it is from the first millennium BC until approximately 1500 year, um, with the arrival of the European ships into the Indian Ocean. Um, however, whether there is um, a definite starting point or a year of decline of the Silk Road, scholars' um, opinions do various, but we will not go into detail today. So, how is this new definition to the Silk Road true, and on what grounds can we argue that the Silk Road is such a kind of broad network? Um, since we cannot go into full detail of every aspect of different finds around the world, um, I am going to mainly um, focus on the tomb of Yu Hong in nowadays Shanxi province in China, which is a Sui dynasty um, tomb. And <coughs> um, I just want to show uh, one panel from the stone coffin of Yu Hong, which is on his Guangpu. So, um, just a few words on the justification of selecting this tomb. Why the tomb of Yu Hong? Because um, the Sui and Tang dynasty is um, one of the peak time during different communications around the world. And also, um, Yu Hong was an official leader called Sa Bao. Um, official leader of Saba, um, of the area of Liangzhou. And Liangzhou is somewhere in nowadays Gansu province in China, uh, which was of um, geographic significance because it was the gateway uh, between China and the outside world. And 
uh, scholars said that uh, Liangzhou was the only section during, within China proper during the third and seventh century um, along Silk Road. Um, so Yu Hong is a guy who is an um, official leader um, within the area of Liangzhou, and the Sabao is kind of a title um, given by the state government to Yu Hong because he was the Sabao was somewhat responsible for all the people living in the area of Liangzhou um, and also other areas um, in same, in northern and western China. Um, and some uh, and Yu Hong is also a guy from he is a guy from Central Asia. Um, called Yu Guo, the, probably the country of the fish, uh, but we don't know where exactly it is now. Uh, but still, he's from the Central Asia, and he is doing something. He is doing something um, in the proper of China. So his identity is kind of like kind of like a mixture of um, different cultural backgrounds, <coughs> both as Chinese, um, as both a Chinese officer and also the origin of Central Asia. That is the reason why we can see different kind of cultural communication in his tomb, which he tried hard to reflect in his tomb. And also, um, there are a lot of Central Asians uh, during the Sui Tang Dynasty in China, but uh, most of their tombs have been seriously robbed. And Yu Hong is one of the best preserved ones, and that is another reason why I choose this tomb. So here is the tomb of Yu Hong. Um, the upper one is the side view, and the lower one is the front view. Um, we're going to uh, mainly focus on this um, stone coffin of Yu Hong and the number five panel of the inner side of his tomb is looking like this. So it is a carved relief panel on which a banquet scene is depicted. And uh, it is about one meter wide and one meter high. Uh, and this, this people is Yu Hong. This is his wife. They are holding drinking vessels together, enjoying people, uh, enjoying people doing dancing performance. And we're going to first look at the flowing of material culture along the Silk Road, which can be reflected on this tiny spot uh, within the whole network of the Silk Road. So this is called a lobed bow, and this is called a stand cup. So we're going to first look at the lobed bow. So the guy, <laughs> so you home here. Yu here is holding something called the lobe bow, called the Duo Shu Chang Bei in Chinese, um, because it's kind of like the weaving around the border of the bow. And it is actually coming from this part of the world, which is nowadays um, some part of uh, Northeast Egypt and Pakistan, Iran, Iraq, and um, Eastern Arabia, and also somewhere um, much of Turkey and Central Asia. So this is the Sasanian Empire, which is the last European empire, and those kind of low bow is the typical drinking vessel used by Sasanians. Um, so how is this kind of vessel, um, how could it be held by um, such a faraway people um, in China? It is because of these people called the Sotians. The Sotians are a very important horse riding mobile people along uh, in the Central Asia, um, and they play a very important role on Silk Road because they are the main trading people. Um, they're probably from this area, like nowadays, um, Uzbekistan. And it is these Sotians who um, Sotianized all of these Sasanian vessels, and they used them and also transported them all the way um, along Central Asia to China and then India. So the pictures here now I present are the ones made by Chinese craftsmen. Um, and they are found in Shanxi province in China. Um, and this is, an, this is, they are all from an 8th century elite material culture hoard called He Jia Tun Jiao Tang. Um, and this one is made of silver, and this one is made of crystal, and both of them are the low bows. Um, and then here, Yuho's wife, and she is holding something called the stem cup. We can, uh, we can hardly um, see what exactly she's holding, but the suggested by the excavators in 1999 and also some other Chinese archaeologists and they said that she is holding something called stem cup or we can call it Gaozu Bei probably in Chinese. Um, it comes from even further away, uh, it's from the Mediterranean and this is a wall painting from the Neuros reign during the Western Roman Empire. 
Um, and uh, within the Mediterranean area, um, objects uh, bear resemblance to the ones depicted on, depicted on wall painting have been found um, a lot. And this kind of stem cups as a drinking vessel was kept being used until the East Roman Empire, um, like this. Uh, those like the different, they are all called the stem cups. Um, some of them in gold and silver, as we have already seen, and some of them made of stone even, and some of them glass. And again, it's because of the Sultans and other Central Asian traders that it traded all the way along to the Eurasian steppe. And this time it goes more, um, it went, went through more details, and we can see the great parts here on the screen, that this is the important area of the Eurasian steppe. Um, there, it used to be um, considered that a lot of barbarians were living there, but actually it's not. Um, those um, steppe people, um, including like the Turkish and also some Tibetan, they played, a, played an important role on Silk Road, and they brought material cultures like this kind of stand cups and other luxuries um, to the northern part of the Tianshan Mountain, um, and then to and then south into Gansu and Xinjiang province in China, and finally to central China. Um, so we can find this kind of stem cups made by Chinese craftsmen during the Tang Dynasty a lot. And there are also um, similar vessels found in Zhonghuang um, and Hotian in Xinjiang. Um, and it, it became so popular uh, in later on China that it probably had some relation uh, to the stem cups made of porcelain during the Indian Qing Dynasty. So that is um, the vessels or the material culture flowing uh, we can see from this panel. And also facing the couple uh, of Yu Hong, um, they are enjoying a kind of dancing performance. And um, what this guy is doing is a kind of Zoroastrian cult dancing. So it was originated from a kind of religion called Zoroastrianism, Xianjiao. Um, and it was the state religion of the Iranian Empire. Um, and this kind of, uh, it is kind of a worship, um, to put it simple, it's a worship of water and fire. Um, and they're doing this kind of dancing um, as a religious ceremony. But then uh, it became part of the daily life and artistic, artistic life of Central Asians. Um, and it influenced later on China and also Japan. So, what exactly kind of dance is this guy doing? We, we are not 100% um, sure. Probably he is doing something called the Sophian whirling dance, we call Wu Xuan Wu. Like this, like it's about turning around and around in very fast uh, pace and without cease. And then another one is called the Bactrian Tanshi dancing, also from Central Asia. Um, it is uh, also about turning around while dancing, but uh, more about in a slower pace and more about showing up the different beautiful accent, dressing accessories and also their costumes while doing a dance. Um, this kind of dance became so popular and also flowed afterwards um, to central China that we can easily find this kind of um, territorial figures in the tombs in central China. So we can see that this these girls are of the typical facial features of Chinese, um, and they are wearing Chinese costumes, but doing this kind of boring dance. And a lot of poets have write poems about this dancing. For example, um, the Tang poet Bai uh, Zhiyu once wrote a poem called Wu Xuan Yu, which means the foreign whirling dancing girl, and she described, uh, he described in detail how these girls do the dance and he said that there is nothing ever more beautiful than these girls in the world. Um, so um, why I put this um, poem here, uh, there's another reason because this kind of dancing girl, they are not necessarily Chinese. Probably they also come from Central Asia. So the Silk Road was not only about trans transportation of material culture or artistic life, but also of human beings. Like these dancing girls and also musicians who were transported along so Road as commodities. Um, so probably we're going to go um, come to the end of today's um, presentation, but there are just a few 
more words on the future directions of this research that we can see the transmission of religion on the Silk Road. Um, and also, Silk, is, Silk itself was used as a payment um, during the 5th and 6th century um, from Central Asia to China and also along the Eurasian steppe. Um, and we can also find more about the historical motivation for the Silk Road, which is probably related to some political reasons, for example, the different diplomacy uh, within, um, within Asia and uh, Europe, like, uh, and also the relationship between China, Tangzhou and Tang China, and the Tibetan Empire and the uh, the Tibetan Empire and the, the other one is the Turkish Empire. So um, just to um, present here that there is a lot more to be studied and there are a lot, a lot more Central Asian tombs in China um, that we can um, have very detailed um, studies on afterwards. So to repeat my argument again that the Silk Road was neither road nor it was the primary export of silk. Is a much broad, um, I, it is a much broad idea that we can imagine. So.